Hey there, it's PK Beats, and welcome to the new year. All calendars and clocks around the world are changing the ending year number from 2020 to 2021. And you know what that means? Nothing. Anyhow, as you can see, I have yet to update my game to the official Sephiroth release patch. As such, the Sephiroth challenge is still available to me, which leads me to believe that he might just be hard locked into this version of the game. So if you're able to change between specific patches of this game, going to version 10.0.0 should let you maybe do the Sephiroth challenge again. So it's not totally gone forever. Though I'll still be taking pride in being one of the few people, whom I know, to beat very hard by bringing Sephiroth into sudden death. Anyhow, the reason why I'm still in the older version is to test this fact by Scully regarding a replay. As we know, one of the changes made in version 10.1.0 was giving Cloud a different variant of his final smash when he's using his Advent Children alt, called Omni slash version 5. The final smash is identical to the normal version in how much damage and knockback it does, and the timing seems to be identical too. However, going back to version 10.0.0, if you were to use Cloud's final smash in this Advent Children alt, it would just be the normal one. But here, I'm going to save this replay of me using this final smash. Going into my replays, you can see the one that I just saved, but also one that was from when Steve was released. I don't actually know when they changed it since I rarely use replays, but it used to be the case that if a replay was from an older version, you just couldn't play it at all, and were forced to delete it. Here, though, I can play this old replay just fine. This is important to know. After I finally updated my game and saw that the Sephiroth challenge is dead, I go to my replays and see, of course, that they're all still there. However, if I go into the replay I saved of me using Cloud's Final Smash, wait for it to get to that point because they still haven't added a fast forward option, we'll see that when he uses it, the animation is a bit off. It's still just called Omni Slash, but this is the same animation as Omni Slash version 5. And as you can no doubt see, Cloud ain't hitting Sephiroth. So the game's replay obviously uses the normal Omni Slash, since that's what happened in the match in the earlier version, but I guess the code or whatever wants to use Omni Slash version 5, because that's what this Cloud Alt does. And right before the final smash ends, the replay crashes. Afterwards, a message appears saying that the replay data stopped midway, and that replays from older versions might not be able to be played to the end. So it's still important to save replays after an update since this might happen, but I like this system way more than just being forced to delete old footage like in Smash 4. For those of you who don't know, the main reason why all of this happens is because replays aren't exactly recordings of your match, rather they're recordings of the inputs and events that happened within your match, that just sort of get re-executed when you watch the replay again. So because it's not video footage, it has to execute the inputs within whatever the game's code is, which is why there may be discrepancies when a new version comes out. Moving on, I'm going to cover more Sephiroth stuff today, and again, I'm going to be starting with his wing mechanic. First up, Takari Barbera asks if healing gets rid of Sephiroth's wing. The test is really simple in that if we lower Sephiroth's percent manually, or have him consume a heart container, his wing will not go away. So the moment he gets his wing, it can't go away if he happens to leave his quote-unquote disadvantage threshold. Though, while you can't lose it through healing, as Sakurai said in the direct, you can lose it by getting KOs. I had a lot of people asking me for the specifics of this. The way this mechanic works is a little different than you'd think. On even stocks, it seems that the wing will go away once you get a single KO. This is also the case if you have more stocks than the opponent. But if you have less stocks than them, you'll see that his wing stays after getting a KO. However, it'll go away not when you get another KO necessarily, but when you deal enough damage. I had wondered if the KO wasn't as necessary as just damage. And when I tried this at a stock disadvantage, I didn't lose my wing even after dealing over 250%. But I lost my wing after just getting one KO, unlike before. However, when I tested at a stock advantage, I lost my wing when I gave Cloud about 200% with no KOs. So what I imagine is that there's some sort of counter for when the wing goes away. And damage adds a little bit to that counter, and KOs add a lot to that counter. 
And what decides how large or small this counter is, is probably how much of a disadvantage or advantage you're in respectively. This is again supported by the fact that normally getting a KO on even stocks removes the wing, but if you get the KO when they're already at high percents, meaning you don't have to deal as much damage to KO them, that KO will not remove your wing. Basically, it's not just whether or not you get a KO that matters, but also how much damage you deal, which is why you may see it sometimes take two KOs rather than one. Also, something I found neat is that while I was pummeling away at Cloud, I noticed that the feathers falling from Sephiroth's wing would keep pausing during their descent. I reckon this means that the feathers are technically a part of Sephiroth's model, and they keep stopping because Sephiroth keeps going into a form of hit stun when dealing damage to Cloud. So that's something else about his wing, I guess. Speaking of the wing mechanic though, MileyFeya101 asks if Sephiroth will be in his one wing state in the home run contest. The answer is simply no. Sephiroth will not have his wing, and I reckon it'll be practically impossible to get it here. Also, Shadow Flare will not give Sandbag the orbiting orbs, which kind of nerfs that aspect of him. I mostly wanted to cover this since the last time I really talked about this game mode was probably back when it was released. To cover the newer stuff, Terry, like Sephiroth, will not have his go meter, and will probably never be able to get it. But primarily, I was curious about what happened with Steve. And in this game mode, you won't be able to summon a crafting table at all. However, all of your tools will already be at the diamond level, and the tools seem to be invincible, or at the very least, way stronger than before, as you can do 5 forward smashes with your diamond sword here, when it would normally break after 4. And yes, you can place blocks and mine, though it's not like you'd really want to do any of these things anyways. Maybe. Back to Sephiroth though, Spider Thunder says that Sephiroth has a unique victory screen if he has his wing when he wins. Unfortunately though, the victory screen he normally gets doesn't seem to change when he wins the match with his wing. That is, his animation doesn't include him having his wing. Like how the bruises Little Mac gets at high percents will be reflected in his victory animation if he wins at said high percents, which we've gone over on this channel before. Sephiroth seems unchanged in this regard. And the one victory screen while he pulls out his wing can still appear even if you never even obtain the wing in the match, so it just seems like there's no correlation. Though still on victory screens, Logan Dolkin asks what Sephiroth's victory screen looks like in a team match. Just like Joker, when Sephiroth's team wins with him performing the best, he'll completely take over the victory screen, with his comrades not showing up anywhere. Or perhaps they're burning alive and we just can't see. And of course, if Sephiroth is not the one who performed the best on the team, he'll just pose in the back as normal. In similar fashion to the last video, we'll now be moving on to facts regarding Sephiroth's impale mechanic. First, Batcat gives me a fact regarding ledge grabbing and impaling. In our last video, we went over how Sephiroth can only use his impale three times before he touches the ground. Anymore, and it just won't work. However, as Batcat states, after you've used all three, even if you grab the ledge, you still won't be able to impale. You have to land on the stage. And this actually relates to a fact given to me by Heck Off Mate regarding the ledge grab limit and impaling. We've also gone over this before, but normally you can grab the ledge a total of six times without touching the stage. Anything more than that, and you simply won't grab it. However, if I were to impale the stage twice, then grab the ledge four times, What this means is that those two impales counted towards the ledge grab limit, despite not actually touching the ledge at all. So what follows from this is the idea that these impales are basically ledge grabs, of sorts. So it makes sense that the ledge grab won't refresh them. Corrin's pin, on the other hand, doesn't seem to affect your total ledge grab count, and as such, grabbing the ledge lets you use the move again. I imagine this is because when you use your pin once, you just straight up can't use that move again until you land. So I guess they just didn't need to put any sort of special limitation on the move, since they could just limit the move itself. Wall jumps also have no effect on the ledge grab limit, though this is because they're actually infinite, and that if you have infinite amount of wall, you can just keep wall jumping. Well, after a while, the jump doesn't go high enough to keep you going upwards, so it's not really infinite, but you know what I mean. Lastly for the impale mechanic, Arb asks how the impale interacts with Spiral Mountain. In our last video, we tested how the impale interacted with a rotating obstacle in Stage Builder. However, this obstacle rotates up and down. 
Spiral Mountain rotates into the Z-axis, which Sephiroth won't be able to necessarily follow. And, like I was expecting, you can't impale the wall while it's rotating at all. And if you impale it right before it starts rotating, you'll just be forced off once it starts. Also, this next fact is something I've seen a ton of people tell me everywhere, so I just feel obligated to cover it. But yes, this attack you see from Scintilla is a projectile. So it can be absorbed. It also means it can be reflected, which in some cases can lead to certain death. This will only work if you hit the shield itself with the bat, as that'll power up the projectile enough to allow the reflect to insta-KO. Otherwise it won't do too much. And you have to make sure the reflector in question isn't too strong, as that'll just end up breaking Scintilla, effectively saving Sephiroth's life. You can also pocket Scintilla. While it looks like you're also pocketing the shield portion of it, you just have the projectiles. And of course, if you pocket Scintilla after it's countered something, when you unpocket it, it'll be crazy strong. Up next, Getsy's gang gives me an interesting thought regarding something that happens in Sephiroth's trailer. In this portion of his revealed trailer, we see Sephiroth cutting Midgar in half. Or rather, him using up air after the stage was already split in half to make it appear like he's doing it, which looks super cool. But the thing is, if you try to recreate this in the game, you'll quickly notice that it's impossible, since Sephiroth is swinging his blade along the x-axis, which would cut the stage in half lengthwise. But in his trailer, he's swinging the blade along the z-axis, cutting it in half widthwise. This means that Sephiroth himself is positioned in the z-axis for this clip. Now in the trailer, he's facing away from the camera, it seems, while our beloved z-axis glitch has him facing towards the camera, but I still think it's super interesting to consider this. Next, Reese Demko gives me an interesting fact regarding Sephiroth's added jump in his wing form. A fun fact about this game is that for characters with multiple aerial jumps like Kirby, you can just hold down the jump button to execute all of these jumps, rather than inputting each one individually. It doesn't work if you hold the button after just your grounded jump though. You have to manually initiate the first double jump, as I'll incorrectly call it, before holding the button down. This is true for other characters with multi-jumps like Jigglypuff, Pit, or Dark Pit, and most importantly, characters with only one extra jump like Charizard and Ridley. With Sephiroth though, while you get one additional aerial jump when you get a wing, you cannot execute that jump by just holding the button down after your first aerial jump. It has to be executed manually. My personal theory is that normally a double jump has this ripple effect appear beneath it. However, all characters that I mentioned before with multi-jumps don't have this ripple, which I guess implies more floatiness to the jumps or something? Sephiroth, though, does have this ripple effect appear, both after his double jump and his triple jump. So I guess his jump is simply categorized differently, likely because he doesn't always have access to it. Finally, for this video, I figured I should cover the latest trending glitch that was discovered before it gets patched or something. It was covered by BB Smash Dudes, so I'll link the video in the description. But to give a basic rundown, hit Ivysaur with Shadow Flare and go towards the Blast Zone with precise timing to where you get KO'd the moment the Shadow Flare is about to hit you. I'm pretty sure this is what the timing is for, and it is kind of strict it seems. I don't know if you have to do this with Ivysaur, but he feels like the most consistent one of the Pokemon to use for this. You'll know you got it when Charizard spawns in with no fire on his tail. Or, you know, when like all special visual effects are gone and your frame rate takes a huge hit. This includes things like your shield, most projectiles, most, okay, well, any effect, really. Sky seems to be the limit. And what's totally crazy is that when a Smash Ball spawns in, it's completely invisible. I was able to locate it by tracking the movement of the camera, and the final Smash itself seemed to work and look okay, but that's still pretty weird. I don't really know why this glitch happens, and I'm honestly not going to embarrass myself trying to guess why, but that's how you get it to happen, so follow what I did to cause it, and have fun messing around. Anyhow, I'd like to thank my patrons Felipe Morla, Avon Karu, Burbo, Linkdorf, Parade Dino, Rain, Dane Play, Furlant, Amon Sharif, Stan Luna, and Zamari. I hope everyone out there enjoyed the holiday season, and whatever break you may or may not have gotten from it. I've got a few more Sephiroth facts I want to cover for my next video, but it'll mostly just be going back to basic general Smash facts, other than focusing just on Sephiroth. Unless I get a sudden surge of Sephiroth based content. I'm just getting out of my own break by making this video, so I'm hoping to get back into the swing of things. 
It's especially awkward since I'm currently transitioning into using a new editing software, but I'm hoping it'll pay off in the future to make my videos higher quality. So with all that, stay casual, and I'll see y'all later. Thank <laughs> you.